with Henry Fonda, taking place December 19, 1975, at Mr. Fonda's home in Bel Air. The subject he'll discuss is his association with Leland Hayward. Henry Fonda is one of America's foremost film and stage actors. And today he's going to discuss with us his recollections of his association with Mr. Leland Hayward. We're sitting in Mr. Fonda's home in Bel Air. Thank you, Mr. Fonda, for speaking with me today. Um, how did you become associated with Leland Hayward? Well, I knew him first almost 50 years ago in New York. I was a struggling actor, and uh, he was one of the top agents, actor's agents and writers. And he didn't pay any attention to me for several years. There was no reason he should. I was an unknown actor struggling. Uh, until he saw me do something in, uh, in a review, The New Faces, 1937, I think. Anyway, he signed me as an agent uh, under an agency contract then. And uh, I still hadn't done anything important. This was just a, several little sketches I did in the review. And that summer, I was in summer stock at Mount Kisco, just north of New York, about 45 minutes. And I got a call from Leland to come to Hollywood. And I had never been interested or ambitious for pictures or Hollywood at all. It had never occurred to me. The theater was my love. Well, I'm making a long story. You can use as much of it as you want. But it's typical Leland because I was totally unknown. But he felt that he could sell me to Hollywood. And I sent him a, a telegram back that I wasn't interested and he sent me a long, long four-page telegram, and I sent a one-word telegram, no, thinking that was funny. Finally, he called me on the phone and called me all sorts of silly names, and he said, look, I'm going to pay your way out here. You don't have to stay but 24 hours. You can go on back, but come on out here. You're not going to know how to make these decisions until you meet somebody. So he talked me into it, and I got a week off from the theater when I was doing the summer theater, and I flew to Hollywood. California, not Hollywood, Los Angeles. And Leland met me at the plane, took me to the Beverly Wilshire Hotel, and um, I remember it was August, very hot, and I was in a summer suit and drenched with the perspiration. I was wet, soaking, and I uh, went and took a shower. And when I came out, there was another man in the room that was a suite. He had a living room, bedroom suite. And I was introduced to this man as Walter Wanger. The name didn't mean anything to me, but it turns out that he was one of the top independent producers in those days. This was 1937, 30, summer of 38. Anyway, no, 38, 28. 30, what am I talking about? 30, uh, 34, in summer of 1934. Anyway, without making it too long a story, Leland sold me to Walter Wanger. And that's the kind of the man he was, because he was, he was a super salesman. He was a very persuasive man. And I found myself shaking hands with Walter Wanger to do two pictures a year for him at an incredible amount of money that I didn't think existed. And after Wanger left, I sort of looked at Leland and felt that had been a big mistake. And I, uh, he never let me forget. I said, how can we get out of it? Because I... I thought there had to be something wrong. Anyway, from that day, he was my agent. I went back to New York, and I, at the end of that summer, I got my first big break in New York in the theater, and the uh, farmer takes a wife. And, of course, now I was somebody known, and Fox wanted to make the film of Farmer Takes a Wife, and Wanger loaned me to Fox at a considerable more money than he was going to pay me, and he gave me half of what's called the overage. Anyway, that's how it all happened to me getting out here, and it was all Leland Hayward, the super salesman. He continued to be my agent through those first five, six years before the war that I was here, 1935 I came out. And uh, by that time, he'd moved his office to California, to Los Angeles, a beautiful office on Wilshire Boulevard, and he was Leland Hayward Luminant, I believe, something like that. 
And he was the top agent. He had Jimmy Stewart and Garbo and Ginger Rogers and Fred Astaire. He had everybody that was important. And I, I did well. Now the war comes along and I joined the Army, I joined the Navy. And when I'm in the Pacific, I get word that Leland Hayward has sold me and his agency to MCA. And I sort of felt like a baseball player that you don't have anything to do with. Your, your contract is sold. And I wasn't sure I was happy about it. And Stuart in Europe, he wasn't sure he was very happy about it. But when we came back, we came back about the same time. Uh, the red carpet went all the way from the airport to the house. And uh, we were wine and dine and parties forever. And Leland was a vice president of MCA. So in a sense, he had sold his agency for a lot of money that he could make a tax gain on. But he was presumably still an agent for MCA. So that went along fine until he really became less and less an agent and began to uh, produce in the theater, not films. And uh, his first play was a big success. I, if it didn't get the Pulitzer Prize, it got the Drama Critics Award or something. I'm not able to say the name of it right, but I'm sure you will know. Uh, and eventually, and I think maybe it was the third play that he did, he sent me, um, or he called me and asked me if I had read Mr. Roberts, the book. And I said, yes, I had. He said, well, I bought it, and I'm going to do a play about it. And I, I said, really? I didn't think there was a play. I said, I loved the book, but I couldn't believe that was a play. Subsequently, I went to New York to see Josh Logan about something else, and I got there the day that Josh had finished writing the play with Tom Hagen of Mr. Roberts. And he read me the play. He didn't let me read it. He read it out loud. And I called Leland immediately, who, in a sense, was still my agent as well as my producer, because he was still on the letterhead at MCA. But Lou Wasserman was more the man that handled me then. And I said, Leland, I just heard the most beautiful play I've ever heard in the world. And I was committed to a picture out here. And I said, you're the producer of this play. It's up to you to get me sprung from the picture that I'm committed to. So two days later, I flew back here, and Lou Wasserman and I met with the producer and director of the picture that I was committed to. And Lou Wasserman did such a brilliant job that they, with tears in their eyes, thanked him at the end for letting them out of the contract. I don't know how he did it, but that's how I got away and went back to do Mr. Roberts, which Leland was the producer of. I played it for four years, and by the time we were on our tour and about to close here in Los Angeles four years later. He brought me the script of Point of No Return, which he wanted to produce next. And within two months, I was in rehearsal in New York again for Point of No Return, and I did that one for two years. So I worked for Leland, in a sense, as a producer for six years in between Mr. Roberts and Point of No Return. And in the meantime, and all through it, he was also my personal friend. He, after he'd moved to Los Angeles, by coincidence, and by that time he had married my first wife, Margaret Sullivan, which sort of made everybody related, and they moved into a home just a block from where I was living with my wife, then wife, and my baby children, and they began to have baby children at the same time, and our children all grew up, and Hayward's and Sullivan's children grew up together in the same sandboxes. And eventually, uh, they were divorced, and uh, of course, this is all, I'm not telling it in, in sequence, because this is all before and, and during and after Mr. Roberts, but uh, mm -hmm. uh, many years and marriages later, he's back in New York, and I always saw him, although I never worked for I did work for him again. I did a big television special for him. Lucille Ball and I did a television special. I can't even remember the Golden 40s, the Roaring 40s, or I can't remember what it was called. But it was a big color tape special, I remember, in the early days of tape. And there may have been some other things that I'm not even remembering. But uh, we were very close all of, all of the years that, since we were first associated. I considered him one of my closest friends, and um, I don't really know what else there is. It's, uh, you know, I'm, uh, his children and my children are still close. His son is my son's partner in the business of oh, yeah. producing. Uh, uh, 
So he, he kind of um, was the person who would, if he, if he liked someone, would then really get out and sell and push. A real... I just yesterday was working with Billy Wilder in Pasadena doing a public service commercial for the Norton Salmon Museum over there. And talking to Billy Wilder, we were talking about Leland. He said, Leland kept telling me, you don't know what a comedian fond is. And Billy says, but I do know. I saw Lady Eve. And Leland never stopped selling or persuading somebody else that there was, you know. He was a, he was a fantastic man of more vitality than eight men put together all of his life. As I said, a super salesman. He was the most persuasive man and the most liked man in the business, in our business almost. I mean, his reputation as a producer, because there are a lot of producers that have very bad reputations, you know, I don't have to name them. Leland's reputation was always the best. He was, he was a gentleman. He was known to be a gentleman. He acted like a gentleman. He didn't do under, you know, behind your back type things, or mm -hmm. he wasn't money mad. He did it um, out of love then, huh? Would you say that? He really was in love with the business. There's no question about it. And and I know that there are, that's too bad there are not uh, other people available to, to talk to you about him because he had so many clients that were, you know, uh, Charlie MacArthur and uh, Ben Hecht, as an example, who were the original crazy writing group. And um, I remember them in the office in the old days, going up to Leland's office. Ben Hecht and Charlie MacArthur would often be in the office there. And... Uh, uh, Garbo and uh, Fred Astaire and Ginger Rogers and Catherine Hepburn. Did he ever get personally involved in the creative aspects of a uh, show you were doing, such as Mr. Roberts? Did he like to get his mm -hmm. hand involved? Oh, in he was always totally involved. He was never not there. He was at every rehearsal and uh, always a good relationship with the director. It wasn't as though he was butting in. Directors always... Uh, had nothing but admiration for him, for his taste. Oh, he, he didn't do anything that he didn't have his hand right in the middle of. And uh, I, 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 except for the movie, Mr. Roberts, which he produced, and I did that too, I forgot that. Uh, he did, well, he did uh, the Lindbergh story with Jim Stewart. Spirit of St. Louis. Spencer Tracy's uh, Old, Man of, the Old Man of the Sea. And um, I know all of you are gonna get a chance to talk to Jim, or have you? Uh, well, I've been trying to. It's, yeah. He's been out of town, I think. Oh. Uh, and Mary but Martin, it's just uh, too bad Tracy and uh, Bogart and uh, yeah. Ben Hecht and MacArthur aren't around to talk to you because I know they'd have great stories. Were you all part of a, of a community of, of friends as well as performers and producers? I guess so. When he, was, uh, when he lived here, we were always neighbors, for one thing, so we saw each other as neighbors always. Mm -hmm. uh, I guess you'd say it was a community. We were back and forth to each other's homes, and uh, not only, uh, you know. What really strikes me is the, the way you describe his spirit in, in regard to uh, the entertainment business. Do you think that sort of thing exists as much today? Well, I'm sure. I don't know. I couldn't name you an individual to compare to Leland Hayward. He was unique. There's no question about it. I think anybody that knew him would say he was a unique, and there isn't another Leland Hayward. That isn't to say there isn't somebody else who doesn't have the same love of the business that Leland had. Um, I'm being handled by Paul Conner now, and I think he's a man that has nothing but love for the business, and he's been in it a long time. Uh, Leland had so many other talents too. He was a fantastic photographer. Did his own, did his own darkroom work and developing, and did beautiful work. Uh, I went to a kind of a tribute to Leland that was given uh, in the uh, Lincoln Center Library for the theater in New York last year, or maybe it was two years ago, for the benefit of the library. And I was there for the opening, and I was, I had seen a lot of his work, but I was really um, very impressed by other things that they had in that show of his, his the photography. 
He also was a cook. He baked bread proudly, you know. But uh, he was a fantastic man and the closest friend. And uh, I, I just, I'm searching for words now. Uh, I'm trying to think of stories even that... Uh, That's what you're saying a lot. It's really What's that? fascinating. <laughs> yeah. So I played him, as a matter of fact. This is just a parenthetical thing. Uh, I did a picture for Sidney Lumet, a remake of a picture that Catherine Hepburn had done many years before called Stage Struck. It was about a theatrical producer and a young starlet. A young starlet, a young actress who's um, trying to get ahead. Catherine Hepburn played it in the movie, and um, Susan Strasberg played it in the picture that I did. And Sidney Lumet's, it was his idea that I'd play him like Leland, which meant that I gave myself a butch. He always had a butch cut. His hair was never any longer than a half inch all over his head. And that was, again, a kind of a trademark, Leland Hayward with his short haircut. And I cut my hair short like that, and not much more than that, but I, I thought of Leland as I played the part as much as I could. Oh, that's... Extremely interesting. You used you used him as the as the person that you would have been if you were really. Yeah. Uh, that's wonderful. Well, thank you very much. Not at all. Very interesting. Good chance to talk to you.